All right, so we are starting back up. I hope you guys enjoyed our very first panel in the Art of a Beautypreneur conversation series today. I was in the background just overjoyed, um, loving the knowledge that they were dropping on us. If you guys do not follow these people in this industry that are the pioneers who are paving the way for people like us, then make sure you are following them again. Um, check our check out my Instagram um, at Yene Damtu, uh, and I will continue to put everybody's handles in the chat. This next conversation is going to pivot into a completely different direction than what we're generally used to hearing beauty professionals talk about. And this panel is called "The Art of Resilience," um, and it is something that is so near and dear to me because I don't think that there is enough people in this industry talking about what it really takes to be a part of it. Um, you see just the highlight reels and the successes of so many industry veterans and you don't really know what goes on behind the scenes and the triumphs that they've overcome to be where they are. I have an amazing panelist and I'm about to bring them on. So just know that you are in for a real, real, real treat for the next hour. To start off, I am going to bring in Sir John. Hey guys, Our what's up? Panelist, I am. Hey, how are you? <laughs> doing well, doing well. Good, good, good. Um, our next panelist that I'm going to bring on is Miss Alicia Leatherwood. Um, say hi to everyone for us. Hi. Good morning. Well, good morning over here in LA. Yes. Same, here. Same here. I'm like, there's a couple of. Uh, this is the. I think I'm the only person in this panel that's on the East Coast. I think everyone's West Coast. Oh Coaster. wow. Okay. <laughs> Two West Coasters, two East Coasters. I'm a New Yorker. Next, I'm a New Yorker, I have to say. Okay, <laughs> okay. Well, if that's the case, I'm a Cali girl, but I'm, I'm on the I'm on the East Coast for this for the matter. <laughs> next, we bring on Miss Nakia Rashawn. Nakia. Hello. And then we have Mr. Keita Moore. What's going on, guys? Hey, guy. How's it going? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Nikita. New York, by the way. New York. Hello guys, how are you? Good. <laughs> All right, so I wanna first start off by saying thank you to my panelists um, for being a part of this conversation. I am super, super, super excited. Um, I said this in the very first session, for those of you who are just tuning on right now, I put this together in less than 10 days um, and I don't have personal relationships. I don't think, I know anybody in real life, actually, that's on the screen with me. Um, I either follow their work and admire them, um, or we've been connected on social media, and all I did was simply slip into their DMs and ask them to be part of them. Um, so I want to send a heartfelt thank you. Um, unlike the last panel where I knew people, I, I don't personally know you guys, but I feel so connected to you all, and I'm so grateful that you guys have decided to share your afternoon with everyone watching and along with me talk about something that I feel is so necessary. So to start off, I um, am going to ask all of you all to quickly introduce yourself to our audience. And then I'm going to uh, ask you all to have a vulnerable and real conversation with me. Um, I want this to be free and relaxed. So feel free to, you know, share what you feel comfortable sharing and, and leave off what you don't want to share. So um, I'll start off with you, uh, Sir John, if you could tell everybody about yourself. And if you guys don't know who he is and, or anybody on this panel for that matter, I think you guys think better. <laughs> but uh, uh, go ahead and take it away. Yeah, so hey, I'm Sir John. I've been working in the editorial community for a long time. Uh, I used to, uh, and so, you know, a celebrity as well, but I used to, I started out uh, as an assistant to Charlotte Tilbury and Pat McGrath. And then, you know, uh, also Mac back in the day, you know, uh, a while ago. Uh, and then life happened. I also had a television show on Lifetime called American Beauty Star. Season one was Adriana Lima was the host. Ashley Graham was the host for season two. And, you know, I'm the L'Oreal guy. So, and also Nikita and I share a client, which we all know and love, Ms. Liz Carter. Yes, 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 yes. All right, Miss Felicia Leatherwood, can you please tell everybody about yourself? So I reside in Los Angeles and um, I'm a natural hair enthusiast. So I'm a celebrity natural hairstylist. I've been in this business for like 20 plus years. Um, some of my celebrities have clientele has been um, Ava DuVernay, Tiana Parrish, Anthony Anderson, Will Smith. I currently work with Issa Rae and Lenny Kravitz now. And I'm a natural hair nerd. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Miss Nakia, you're on mute, honey. Oh, there yeah. we go. Okay. Okay. Tell everybody who you are. Um, my name is Nakia Sean. 
I am, I love everything about this. I don't have a specific texture that um, that I'm not interested in. I'm from Sacramento. I've been living in LA since 2012 and fortunate to have amazing mentors. Um, one in which I'm sure everyone who's on knows Kim Kimball. Um, and a lot, Chucky, Amos, and a lot of the legendary stylists in the industry. So I'm super grateful and I've been blessed with an amazing career. Um, and my main clients have been Ms. Carter and Tia Mari. Um, so yeah. Perfect. All right. I'm going to go over to Mr. Kisa. Can you tell everybody about yourself? Hey everyone, my name is Keita Moore. I am a artist first. I've been an artist all my life and I've been into makeup about eight years. Um, I'm from New York area, so shout out to everyone that's from New York. Um, my clients have been, throughout the eight years, I've had the clientele such as like um, Nicki Minaj, Iman, CoverGirl, uh, Maybelline, all that good stuff. And I'm excited to be here. Thank you, thank you. And finally, Mr. Cos Spence, I think the baby of the group. So I'm super happy to have you on. <laughs> hey guys. Um, baby Cos. Nice to meet some of you guys, but I know some of you guys. Um, I'm from New York originally, but I was out in New York. I've been doing hair for like the past five years professionally, but I've been uh, loving the idea of hair since I've been here. Um, I find this includes like LMA, Kaylani, Harden, and a few other names, but I mainly work with Kaylani. Hey, hey, lean, babe, lean into the cam, lean into the microphone just a yeah. little bit more. Lean into the microphone just a bit. Oh, you guys can't hear me. Now I can. Now yeah, I can. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So sorry. Oh, sorry. So I'm from New York. I am living in LA. Um, I'm a OGX lead director, and then my client list includes Cardi B, uh, Kaylani, Ella May, but I mainly work with Kaylani and Ella May, and I'm building a house right now, so that's one of my main focuses. Nice. Yes. 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 Congratulations. Yes. That's what's up. So, right. Yes. So. That's the that's the stats rundown of everybody that's on this panel. So yeah. we got we got that out of the way. And now this is where what I'm going to love is this conversation that we're going to have. And I basically have kind of curated this group because I think that everyone looks at each of you and thinks that, oh, my God, they have these amazing people that they service and that they work with. And that is what defines them. And I think that there are so many layers to who you are, aside from the client that you work with that represents you, right, in the public mm -hmm. or virtual sphere. And I want this conversation to be about you as an individual and you as a creative. So I'm going to kick it off with Ms. Felicia Leatherwood and just kind of ask you, you are a natural hair care expert, right? And so you worked in so many different worlds and you had you have your own brush line out and you've just done so many things. And I think that it just shows me something that every one of you have is this, this, this spirit of being resilient. Um, and I just want you to share with everyone what that, what does resilience mean for you? You created a lane that wasn't really known. You created a lane to be a natural hair care expert. And that wasn't something that is respected or that was ever thought about when you think as a celebrity hairstylist. That's not something that is like, oh, I'm gonna go be a natural hair care celebrity expert. Um, so tell us what that looks like. I'm gonna uh, go a little tip in. Um, can you hear me? Here's something happening. Yeah. Okay, we go. so my, when I say hotel, I mean like just into the spiritual world of, of what I've done in my life. I feel like ancestrally I've been guided when to move and when to not move. Mm. Natural hair never was a thing, but I didn't care because I felt like it was something I was supposed to do. I used to actually work in corporate America. I worked behind the scenes in production at Warner Brothers, BT, MTV, Fox, all these places, but I hated it. I felt completely out of place and extremely, I had anxiety attacks going in that office every time, every day. And so I always, played with hair since the age of like 10 years old, I was playing in hair. I taught myself how to braid at 11 years old. So for me to leave 
corporate work, the office, and go home and braid hair until midnight and turn around and go back to work, I was like, this isn't working for me. I just want to do hair. Everybody was like, wait, you're going to leave this job, this nine to five guaranteed money, 401k to go do hair when there's a hair size on every single corner? You sure? I said, something inside of me is telling me to do it. It's time to go. So I did it. I was very scared. That was the beginning of the resilience, <laughs> you know, fear. But when it, whenever I felt the fear, that was my opportunity to say, I think I'm supposed to do this. Whenever I felt scared, it let me know to go forth and do it and be resilient. And so this was the best decision I've ever made in my whole life, being a natural hairstylist. Um, of course, at first I bootlegged and did it from home. Uh, like a lot of us do, you know, um, but in the state of California, they started to crack down and say, you have to have a license, even if you put water on hair. I wanted to follow the rules. So I went to school, cosmetology school, got my license to do hair, but they didn't even talk about natural hair. So I went ahead into the natural hair field. And here we are today with a whole movement and community of natural hair. So if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. And I just felt like I've been ready, you know? I have to write that one down. That's a good one. I use that often. <laughs> All right. Yes, so, that was good. So, Nakia, um, I know I've gotten a chance to know you recently. And I know that you are a mother. Um, mm -hmm. And you just shared you have a very high-profile client. And I think that... As Felicia just said, you have to pivot and you have to trust your spirits and your, the energies around you and what your gut instinct is telling you. And I think there's the, people talk about this motherly instinct, right? And so mm -hmm. I think that part of being resilient is making a choice to show up in all parts of your life. So right. for you, what has that looked like? Balancing a high profile client, being a wife, being a mother of two kids, um, having a passion for hair, how have you done it and still been able to show up in all avenues of your life? Man, I would say, um, I think in the first series, um, the first part of the Black Summit, um, they spoke on, um, I think it was Tippy. she spoke on basically um, being available. You know, when you first start, you have to be available all the time, nonstop, you never know. Like, so it's, you really don't have a schedule, but then you have family at home, so you're like slacking at home and putting everything into work, but then you get to a position where you start to gain the trust of your clients and th they understand your work ethic and they understand your values and everything. So then you can kind of decide like, okay, what matters the most to me? And how am I gonna make sure that I can show up and give 100% to my clientele and 100% to my family? Um, so what I had to do is I had to not take on every single thing all the time. Um, I've been developing like a community of other stylists who can um, like we're all, we can all collaborate and help each other out when the time comes so that because the reason I got into this industry was for one, it was my dream and something that I've done as a young child. I start braiding at um, 12 and I was working in a braiding shop when I was a kid. Um, but overall, it was to be able to provide a different lifestyle for my family. Um, taking all those struggles and everything as a kid and making sure that my family doesn't have to go through that. Um, so I would, in the beginning, I would be at work 24 hours a day. Sometimes I just come home, take a shower and um, get right back to work. And it wasn't working out for me. Like my husband wasn't seeing me. My son, he wasn't listening to me. And I just prayed and prayed. And I had, I quit one of the best, I quit a job at, um, I was making, I finally had reached um, a financial point to where I didn't have to necessarily live check to check, but I felt that it was such a burden on my family and I almost lost everything. Mm -hmm. um, so I just had to, I prayed and I had to let the job go. I had to quit and didn't know how or what I was going to do. And I just feel like having faith and believing in yourself and believing that God will have you regardless, no matter what, then things will happen. Like, um, I think I was feeling like, I was gonna, like, I was ready to go home. Uh, my husband, he wouldn't let me do that, but I was ready to like, just forget about it and, you know, figure out what else I can do. And then I got the call um, to work with Miss Carter. And I came to her at a point where- hey, Nikia, yes. Nikia, hey, rewind that back and we, I just missed you for that. You, you missed a really good part. I just, 
I'm sorry. I just want to hear the last thing you said. You got you cut out for one second. Oh, okay. Um, Bring us right back. Which can you tell me that part? Just a minute. Just a minute prior. Just a minute prior. Okay. Right, um, right well, so basically, when I thought, when I thought so I thought that it would be the end, and I didn't really know what I would be doing. Um, ready to move back to Sacramento or find a corporate job or anything. Then I got a call from um, Miss Tina, who is one of my clients, and she's been for a long time, um, asking me if I can be the stylist for Miss Carter, just kind of maintaining and just being available for her. And just so grateful that everything worked out the way it should. Um, I was able to be a mom and be a girlfriend at the time. Now I'm a wife and be there for my family as well as have the career. It's not working? No, I'm doing no. a single lady oh, wife. <laughs> um, but that just kind of opened up and allowed me to be a mom, the best mom that I can be and be there for my husband and his dreams as well as believing in myself and following my dreams with the career of my, you know, the thing I've been wanting to do all my life. So to say this is just, but I believed in myself right when I thought it was the end and just prayed on it and left it to God and stopped worrying about, okay, well, what about this? And how am I going to do this? Cause it used to be, I got to take every single job, everything, like every single job I would take back to back to back. I was worn out, exhausted. My son wasn't listening to me. And now I'm blessed with the daughter, um, being able to work and be a mom and continue to follow my dreams and inspire other people, hopefully, because I mean, I was told that, when I was pregnant, pregnant before, I wouldn't be able to be a celebrity hairstylist. No. I'd be at a wedding. So, so you you bring up a couple of things um, about being just trusting yourself and just getting to that place where you wanted to give up or that you weren't really sure. So I'm gonna pivot this to Ka. Um, I have gotten a chance to know about your story, and I don't think that enough people do. I don't think people know your journey. I know that. You just shared with everyone that you're building a house um, from scratch, but I believe this is your second home. Yeah. Um, and people are looking at your life and seeing that you've worked with some industry heavy hitters and that you have all this stuff and you're so young and you're just killing it. But people don't really know what's behind mm -hmm. the, this, the, the char character of cost Spence. So I know that less than five years ago, you were in a completely different industry. Um, I know that you have overcome some hardships and, and some tragedies in your life house. So what can you talk about how throughout everything else that goes on in your personal life, how you were still able to move forward in your professional life and show up to work regardless of what was going on? I think like Nikia said, just being around a good group of people. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think like she said, being around a good group of people and just being around people who just are giving you the type of energy you need 24 seven. For me, it was mainly about like focusing. In like 2017, my mom had passed away and she was like one of the like uh, biggest things and biggest inspirations in my life. And then once that happened, I was like so caught off guard. And I think for a second, literally like maybe like a split second, I kind of wanted to just stop doing hair in general. I had just started professionally like two years prior and then something in me was like, I don't think this is what she would have wanted. Um, mm. There were so many moments that I was regretting with doing hair because I was like, I don't want to move on in doing hair. And, you know, she's one of the reasons why I started. I started out doing her hair. And then now that she's not here, like, what's the point of doing all this? But I think something had told me and God had like put something in me that was just like, you have to keep going. You have to keep doing it just for her. And so ever since then, I've literally just been like focused and on a straight path and just haven't stopped working since and just haven't like taken a taken a moment to really like think about it all which sounds crazy but i mean it's been able to keep me on this track for the past few years it's been very interesting though i love it sir john you have worked in so many different parts of this industry and i think one of the things that i loved is you talked about being an assistant and i think that there's so many of us that look at you and are like he has the these elite clientele, he has made it, he worked, you've crossed cultures, right? You have clients in, in, in every segment of the industry um, and you work with brands, you work with celebrity clients, you, you've done campaigns. What, I, I think that there is something, when you are an assistant that you, people think that if you are an assistant that you are less than. And I think it takes something within you to kind of keep pushing and showing up. So can you talk about your journey as an assistant and how it led you to where you are now? 
Well, guys, if you, you can't lead in so you can effectively follow someone. So I feel like, you know, each one of us, you know, has a, their own journey that they've been on. But it's really one of those things where it's you're walking into the wilderness. There's no plan. There's no, you know, everyone else around us has a plan when they went to school for nursing or being a doctor or whatever that looks like. But it's it's one of those things where you just have to have faith in, in yourself as an inner GPS, you know, and just like and keep looking for the light. And what is the light? The light is. You know, the light is inspiration. The light is, you know, what you wake up daily, you know, searching for. And it changes. It doesn't, it's not the same year after year. It's not the same month after month. I think my goal has literally been so many different things. But what's consistent is what I want to give my clients. And which is like, you know, me, all of me being completely real. And also showing women all around the world what the women I grew up with uh, are like, basically. Mm, I love that. Showing people what you grew up with. Um, so Kita, people don't yeah. know your people. A lot of people don't know your story. So tell tell everybody your story. Tell everybody what your journey about how you got into to makeup and and where you are now and what it, how it started. Well, I've been an artist all my life. Like I draw, paint, and I still do it on the side. And I've actually went through school and went to college for art. It wasn't until um, maybe like eight years ago I started doing makeup. And it was kind of happened by accident, but I say nothing is ever an accident. It's always a coincidence. You know, God has a way of changing your path. Mm -hmm. And um, I was working in corporate America in 95 and I start going by the Mac, the Mac cosmetic counter. And uh, one of my friends that worked there, she was like, hey, I'm doing a, um, a fashion show. I'm from upstate New York, Rochester, which is six hours away. Buffalo. So, Buffalo. Buffalo. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, oh yeah, I, I keep forgetting you're from uh, Buffalo. So um, I ended up doing it, scared as heck. And my mom, she used to be Mary, uh, Mary Kay representative. So she intro actually introduced me to beauty, what beauty was. But I never said, okay, I want to be a makeup artist. Um, so I did the, the fashion show, super scared. And, you know, I, it was like three other makeup artists there. Two of them was already professionals and I was the only newbie. And when I turned around, it was like a line of girls like, oh, my gosh, I want him to do my makeup. And that's when I thought to myself, like, hey, you can do this, you know. And so I went back and forth to New York going to castings for like Love and Hip Hop and other um jobs and gigs and stuff like that and i actually started working started working doing love and hip-hop reunions and then like one thing led to another and you know I, i've been blessed to have some amazing clients and you know do some great things well can i say okay. something He's being up. we're all, all you guys are being humble right thank first you all, this, is, this is what i'm talking about thank you sir john just call all, people out you know, I, I love what you guys are doing right now, but also you guys have to realize that you guys are like voices to our community and our stories need to be told. And we need representatives on and every post. Like, you know, like yeah. I, started, I started doing shows and I started, I moved to LA and I see now Keith, that you're out here doing kind of the same thing like I was doing with the girls. Yeah. And so like, I think we're all championing women. And I think it's never been a time that's been more important for all of us to you know, uh, lift women up in general. I mean, Mother's Day is Sunday, and not to pivot to you know to get, sound like a feminist, but I am. I think that right now what we what we do is we leave everything we have on the heads and the faces of the people that we work with. And I, I think the goal of for us is we're storytellers. You know, at the end of the day, and it doesn't matter if you are you know a hairstylist, a stylist. We're all telling the story. We're all trying to communicate. We're all trying to basically these are time capsules. Every time we do a video, every time we do a campaign, every time you send someone on the red carpet. It's a time capsule. It's something that we'll look back at, and it's it's a sense of punctuation, you know, through that period. So uh, our stories really just need to be told, and I'm I'm just glad and honored and humbled to be, you know, in the room with you guys. That is me. And same here. Same here. So I that totally right there, that is when I when I reach out to you and I've talked to all y'all independently. I said that what I wanted this to be about is storytelling and understanding that there are so many people that are watching who look at us and 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 they don't see that they could ever be us because they don't see the connection in our story, right? But there is a lot of things that we have experienced throughout our careers that someone that may just be starting out could have seen or that has made them want to drop out of this industry or pivot into a different direction. So I'm gonna quickly, I just want you guys to know that all of your stories are important and all of your stories need to be told, which is why I brought you guys on this platform. Um, Felicia, you, you do so many things. And like I brought up earlier, 
you created a lane for yourself. Hmm. What was that like? What was the what was the process of creating a lane for yourself? You not only created a lane for yourself when it came with hair and pivoting from corporate America, but then you created like a physical product, right? That has changed the hair industry for natural hair care. And as there is this movement of telling women's story, a story that's never told is the woman of a black woman that wears natural hair, right? So what has that looked like? How, what was the, what was the pushback that you got from people that were like, oh no, this isn't necessary, this doesn't matter. Mm. She's, so, a, she's an agent as well too. Just to add to you. Uh, you know, <laughs> I'm ready to tell my story. <laughs> I didn't want to take over the conversation until everybody introduced themselves. Uh, so my story has a lot of foes and you cut me off when I go too long. Uh, but basically I'm going to go back to the spiritual side. Anytime they contacts me and they go, how did you do it? I tell them it was like blood, sweat, and tears. Like literally I was saying affirmations daily and I had to get to the other side of that. I grew up in a very religious home and that's not bad. But what was missing was me believing in myself, stepping out of the, you know, I'm hoping um, and, 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 and the believing into the knowing. So while I was believing, I didn't get to the knowing until I was praying and I heard the spirit tell me, you know, you got this. Why are you keep asking me about it? Like I already gave it to you. You just got to go ahead and do the work. So what that looked like, and still to this day, I've learned so much uh, as a businesswoman. What that looked like was me traveling. I would take, uh, when I first started doing hair, I said, you know what? I woke up one day and I'm a little, I'm probably older than everybody on this panel, which is not a badge of honor, just to let you know when I get into what I'm about to say. I woke up one day, my whole body hurt. My back hurt, my hands hurt. I sat on the side of my bed and I said, wow, am I going to have to stop doing hair? Like, this is really hard on my body. I'm feeling it. It's been years. And I said, God, you know, I want to stay in the business, but I can't keep working the way I'm working. I need either one client that gives me all the money, you know, or I need to create another lane that I enjoy to stay in the hair game, but just not behind the chair so hard. And I heard the voice say, do some workshops, do some natural hair work workshops. And I was like, wow, well, what does that look like? All you have to do, anybody watching, is when you sit down, a lot of times we try to figure too many things out. And the universe already has a law of attraction in place. It does not change. It don't matter about COVID. It don't matter about anybody doing anything to the community of us. The laws of attraction work. And the law of attraction says you can have whatever you believe you deserve good or bad so we don't always have to put so much thought well how do i leave my job well how do i well if i do this then i'm i mean literally doors got open i was working in corporate america wanted to go to cosmetology school didn't know how i was going to do that and still pay my rent ran into in the commissary went to lunch ran into this guy that i knew, grew up uh knowing we went to school together we ended up dating and he said look I know you want to do hair. Let me pay for it. Leave, leave Warner Brothers. I got you. And baby, let me tell you, I went to school <laughs> to pay for it. But a month before I graduated, we broke up. <laughs> like bad, you know, like bad, bad. And I had to just take all my stuff in tow because we live together. We go stay with my friend. In that time that I was with this man and going through school, his mother saw me always working in the kitchen doing hair. She was at one of the high profile salons here in LA called Millennium. It used to be on Third mm -hmm. Street. Mm -hmm. And all the celebrities came in there. We had barbers. I mean, you had everybody, all the ball players were there. We had the weave, like everybody was at the salon. And Eric and Anthony, who were the top uh, hairstylists there, they were on the plane with Aaliyah um, and, and they we lost them. Um, oh, wow. That unfortunately. Really? So that kind of like changed the whole perspective. But I had the opportunity to go there because this boyfriend and you just don't know, everything leads to something. So even though I was in that relationship, it went bad. His mom told the salon about me, 
said, hey, there's a natural hairstylist, my, my son's girlfriend. I graduated school, went to the salon, they're doing my little thing. All the celebrities came in. Before that, working at BET as a, well, BET is like, treats you like a Jamaican. So you're going to do 50,000 jobs and get paid for half, you know. But even there, you keeping it all the way real. I'm here for it. It had to be so transparent, baby. Like you don't know, the commercials get cut <laughs> off and the show starts. So, <laughs> you know, as BET. But I just remember having the opportunity to basically, um, from that point, leave there and go do hair. And all the celebrities that had been coming up, all the comedians, everybody used to see me behind the scenes, came to the salon to get their haircut. said, oh, Felicia, you do hair now? Like you left BT, we wonder where you went and they became my clients. So that became my life was just basically having that connection. Just, you just never know how things unfold. And that whole broken heart was for something great. That whole relationship that I thought didn't work for me or wasn't working totally, my whole life now is it's been amazing. So yes, I created a um, detangler brush because what I found out, I had a celebrity, um, I'm sorry, I had a, a client, an older woman with a lot of money and she used to have a product and she said, there's two things you need in order to survive in your life. One, you need a product that sells for you when you're asleep. If you get sick, if you can't work anymore, you need something that'll keep you going. The other thing is you need something that people can only get from you. They don't know how to describe what it is, mm. but you're the only one that can provide it. Mm. Y'all know what that is? That. I'm sorry, I felt that. Oh, I'm, over, I'm over here taking notes, Felicia. Okay. <laughs> I'm taking notes too. <laughs> I'm writing it down. <laughs> One thing so, oh, hey, you're back. Sorry, I my computer crashed. Crash. I was like, oh my God. Oh, yeah. So I, was <laughs> telling, I was talking about how I had this client who was an older woman, very wealthy, and she said, there's two things that you need in order to survive in your life. Uh, one is a product that sells for you when you get sick, when you don't want to work anymore, while you're sleeping, you're selling something. She said, and the mm -hmm. other thing you need is something that people can only get from you. They don't even know how to describe what it is, but you're the only one that can provide it. Does anybody know what that is? The I essence of I who haven't. you are. The essence of who you are. Sir John, Kia, wow. Kia, Kai, yeah. Yeah, like what you provide is who you are. And that's what people come back to get. And no one can copy that. That is your brand. That is who you, who people want to attach to. So anybody watching, you have something within you that is a light that people want to gravitate to and they want that. And all you have to figure out is how to bottle it up, how to bottle that thing up so that you can provide it for people. So I started the brush, the detainment. So you just said oh. something. You, I'm sorry, you just said something that I, 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 I've talked with some of you guys about. And I think that since so many of us are in public eyes and we have highly visible clients, we are also, we are, a, we are in a position to be highlighted and recognized, but we are also in a, a position to be attacked, right? And be victimized. And I don't, and I think so many of us get so caught up in what we, who we are trying to appeal to or who we're trying to appease or who we're, we're, we're looking for validation in the wrong places. And so mm. I always say, you just said, it's you, you are the secret sauce. I may not be the best hairstylist, but my client may come back to me because I make them feel good. And people get so caught up, people get so caught up in their, their physical craft that they forget who they are and they start molding and becoming someone else, right? But also I think um, social media puts a whole lot of smoke and mirrors in front of us. We look at people's lives and we think, oh, that's easy, I'll go get that. That was created from somebody really, really on their knees. Somebody was praying for them. They was praying for themselves. They had to like, they had to be an assistant sometimes and get treated a certain way. We've all had situations where we're like, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You've questioned, mm -hmm. you know, your ability based on one bad situation. And 
one thing I know is that whatever you believe you achieve, we've heard it. And in our community, there's a lot of competition always created amongst us. It's not necessary. There's enough for everybody to get some. Yes, yes. yes. Go ahead, Sir John. Go ahead, take us home. And to your point, it's we, we shouldn't even believe in competition. I feel like we shouldn't even teach our kids competition in school because at the end of the day, I could have the same tools you have, or you could take, teach me you know, how to make gumbo the same way you do, and I'll like, never be able to create it or recreate it, you know? Right. So, and, so it's your special sauce, just your DNA. And, you know, like you said, I'm not necessarily in the business of like makeup. Everyone's like, oh, you know, you're a great makeup artist. Yeah, but it's a lot of people who do beautiful makeup. There's so many people who do amazing hair. But I'm in the business of people. And like, you know, people will fight for you, they will campaign for you, they will fly you, whatever you need to fly, and take care of your whole, whatever you are asking for, if you remember that they want to feel something. So basically it's, it's bigger than makeup, it's bigger than something that's topical or physical or aesthetic. Yes, yes. And, yes. and, and to take it back to what okay. um, Felicia go, I was gonna say, Keita, go, go, we talked about this yesterday. <laughs> take it back to Alicia. Oh no, I was gonna piggyback off what Alicia said about, you know, that what the essence of you is and, um, I feel like so like when it comes to social media, so many people get caught up on like what you're doing as an artist. They forget to set goals and boundaries for themselves. You get what I'm saying? And everyone has a purpose. And that's something that you basically contribute to the planet that the planet wouldn't get otherwise. You understand mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't amount to social media likes or money or anything like that. It's just your true, your true value. You know, and I feel like when it comes to that, people look at other people and say, oh, my gosh, like you're successful. But, you know, maybe you are successful, too, because we're not all going to attain the same level of success. Um, success means something different to each and every single last one of us, you know, and I believe for in order for us to know what success is, we need to understand what success is. Mm. Oh, good. And, yeah. you know, That's right there. So, so Keita, we talked yesterday and we were talking about, I think that there is also this, this attitude with people in this industry, what, not, it doesn't matter if you are dealing with high, any client that you are dealing with, we feel like we have um, control or we, that they are our property and that if, that there, we have this mentality, it's that competitive spirit, right? So people aren't willing to share, but we talked about this yesterday. I want you to share yeah. this with everybody about how we do not own our clients. We, we do don't not own them. We don't own our clients. You could be here today and gone tomorrow. Right. And um, actually, when what we were talking about was basically, you know, making recommendations and stuff like that. Like when I make a recommendation to community, because you know, we we are all that we have, and we we need to, you know, definitely focus on that so that we could be in this together. You know, when I make the rec recommendations to any of my clients, I'm going to make sure that there's someone good that there's someone professional and, you know, that there's someone that can deliver the type of work that I know that my client need, you know, yeah. and I never worry about, I used to, but I never worry about if they come back or not because mm -hmm. I've had clients that didn't come back, you know, and, you know, you kind of get used to <laughs> that, that type of stuff, but that's what really makes you resilient because you can you can get depressed over stuff like that, mm -hmm. you know, and it can make you feel like you aren't enough when you need to, you know, listen to your inner voice that continue to tell you that you are enough, you're worthy, you're chosen, and you're marked, you know, and that something bigger is uh, is in place and going to come. Go ahead, Sir John. Hey, so also one thing is this is you know on the topics of resilience is listen there is there is no the, the most successful people always continue to push the finish line back. So like, you know, when you think that you get into a place where like, oh, this is what I wanted. It's, it's never, you're never gonna be, I've never met a content rich person or somebody who's like, oh, I don't want anything else. I'm just gonna stop here. No, it's, you know, we, it shapes itself as you go. And, you know, it's great to have great clients. It's great to have people who people recognize, you know, but at the end of the day, that's their shit. Like, you know, that, that's their stuff, you know? And I had a very sure. healthy working knowledge that, you know, my clients are my clients. They're not my friends. When I say my friends, yes, I love them dearly. I will do anything for them. And they, they feel the love for me. I don't even have to talk about it. Like one thing is, I know we're talking about everyone's secret sauce. You have to be confident enough to walk away, confident enough to let somebody else fill your shoes, confident enough to actually know that I'm delivering everything that I have to this person. And if it's not enough, 
then it's, this is just misalignment. And I, I can't, you know, I can't, I can't push back on that misalignment. But if I know I'm delivering what I have to these people, no, walk away. When I say walk away, it's okay to say no to a job. I'll say no before I say yes. Like, you know, be, I, you also want to create a sense of scarcity for yourself in the market so you can have, in terms of branding, you know, the, the goal is, especially, us, I hate to say this, guys, but especially as people of color, we have to be yes. able to have a sense of vision of where we want ourselves to look like on this scale, you know? So, like, for me, I didn't do music videos when I first started. I was like, I'm not going to do music videos. I was, and I was, guys, I was starving because I was an editorial assistant working in fashion. But I was like, I know when people are going to search for my name, I don't want everything to come up that's just like just hip hop. So, you know, and what it is, it's like I need I want it to be seen on a global scale. I wanted to I want to rock with women all around the world. You know, so mm. I, sometimes you got to say no before you can say yes. And don't say don't attach yourself to every project just because there's money involved. So what I did is I started working. Not on all money is good money. Not yeah. all money is good money. Oh, no. go okay, Kai. Say, go ahead. I'll say uh, it. No, Kai. no, no. I was just, I was just saying that basically, you know, it's, it's, it's an inside job. And if you're doing the work on yourself, you'll realize that these clients are, yes, I love my clients, but possibly they may need to have a different person on their face. So maybe they may need to have a different person on here so they can appreciate, you know, the dynamic that you offer. And like I said earlier, it's not always about doing great hair and makeup. It's about, hey, do I have something to, to contribute to the conversation? You know, can, can I? Talk to my, you know, my client as we're sitting on a set for Vogue or whatever this looks yeah, like. In this campaign. Can I talk about references that are larger than just makeup, you know. So can I, you know, can I educate my consumer? Can I educate my clients? So it's your job as artists to, you know, be one step above. They're looking to you for your expertise. They want you to. They have you there. They're paying you for a reason. So having perspective, having some insight, you know, knowing culture, knowing references, knowing things that came before us is the only way you're going to know where we're going. Ka, I want you to talk about. You, you, your story. When you started, if I'm if I'm correct, you started working with Kalani, and it was an opportunity where Ella was doing something, and you she needed somebody, and you kind of just stepped in, correct? Like you worked with her. There was a sim. You talk about it more. Yeah, I mean, when I first started, I started out working in reality television first, and then I kind of jumped into Kalani probably later that year. And while being on tour with her, I met Ella and kind of just like scurried away. Um, and it was a great experience, but I kind of wanted to piggyback off of what Sir John and Felicia were saying, just about solely relying on you as a person and you as a brand. I think that's mm -hmm. super important because what you want to do is make sure that the focus is around you and not necessarily your clients, because your client's life is your client's life. One thing I did was I tried and made sure that I was investing in myself, which is why I just launched my own business outside of my clients with a fragrance that did sell out recently. And you know, I'm working on other businesses, but I think that's mainly the goal is just to make sure that like you are the main focus and then the clients come because when they leave and like you guys said, when they go on to the next person they want to work with, because they want different right. things around them, you then have to, you know, sit back and think, you know, what's next for me to do? And if you weren't preparing for that, like you guys were saying earlier, mm -hmm. preparation is key, then you know, you might be stuck. So preparation is always key and make sure you're fully relying on yourself and not all of your clients. I want to just, just have a plan. back up for Sir John and Kita and Kai. <laughs> and uh, one thing that Kita was trying to say earlier. So in terms of that whole um, being attached to the client, uh, you have to have self-awareness because the ego is always present. I mean, always, always talk. And it's that other voice that creates jealousy, envy. You know, anything negative that you think about, it thinks it's protecting you, but it's really just creating a whole bunch of fears. And so what I did when I heard that voice uh, make me feel like somebody was coming for my work, um, I had a lot of hairstylists hit me up and ask me, how do you do it? How do you become a celebrity hairstylist? You can't do everything. We can't do all the clients. So I created a company called Texture Management where I manage 17 hairstylists and makeup artists around the world so that they get spotlighted. They get clients. They get to work on Issa and Tiana and Ava and any of the other celebrities I've had access to so that they have the experience and people know that it's not just me. The spotlight, I'm getting older. I'm not going to be doing this forever. I'm selling brushes now, you know what I mean? And other stuff coming. <laughs> so I really wanted the up and coming, the young people. Like you guys saw Nikki B did the Cosmo cover with Issa. Yeah. She'll, she'll, be, she'll be on F4. She'll be yeah. on F4. Yeah. Girl, I was like, and I had to sit and think, who could rock this out and make Issa feel comfortable? Because when mm -hmm. you refer somebody, your client, 
They also need to be someone that knows how to be professional. Uh, you have to look at your client's personality and say who fits, who can fit in this. Right. So anybody watching, like you can't show up, you know, all rah rah when the client is mellow. You gotta like read the situation. You can't yeah. be talking to them. They reading the script and they're trying to study something, and you're just talking, talking, talking. No, if they're on their phone doing something, you looking over their shoulder making comments. Don't that's not professional. Uh, right. You know, so it's it's it. Texture management has really helped my my um, self awareness expand into a place of love for other hairstylists and showcasing them. And yeah. so, yes. I'm, I'm, you know, I love that. I and I'll also, I'll also I love that you're. I'm saying, no, can you, can you, can you, you want to go for it? Oh no, I was just agreeing with Felicia because at the end of the day, the clientele that we have, um, there's no way that we can ever do every single thing for them every time. So why not build a community of other talented people or teach other people? Because I mean, that's how I learned. I was assistant, had a full clientele, left Sacramento and then assisted in LA with nothing. And that's how you continue to lift other people up who don't think that this can happen for them. That's how you continue to build confidence in our communities and, and break barriers. So everything that you said, that's so amazing. I'm, offer that building a community teaching passing on the wealth because i think that's the biggest thing in our um culture is that we feel like we have to compete it's like and i feel like with black women because i can only speak for black women um somehow we're raised to feel like it's always a competition like you see a woman walk by and she's fly her hair is cute or her skin is amazing tell her because yeah. maybe someone didn't or maybe she's going through something else like it's bigger than that like we need to lift each other up just like a lot of these other cultures do and that's how we can continue to thrive and to grow and teach our families and everyone else and inspire everybody um i think yeah. it's amazing that go ahead Kyle. i'm sorry no no go ahead sorry okay. um i just think that it's very important especially in these times um to just have a community Yes, I call yeah. it a tribe. <laughs> yes, the tribe. Find, find your tribe. Okay, so also, you know what? There's an I feel like a lot of people don't talk about this, but there's also an etiquette to you know to working in this business. When I say etiquette, you know, as people of color, one of the things is we have to realize we've always been a source of inspiration. It's a fine line that balance between appreciating and appropriating, you know. So we've always been ciphered off of, but what one thing is, I, I realized that, you know, working on sets or being on a Pier 59 Studios, whatever that looks like, we have to also make sure that, you know, we represent ourselves. We translate well. Like when I say we translate well, it's like, it's not about speaking good. Who is speaking good? It's not about that. It's about basically being your most showing self, raising the bar for your, your talent, of being the best representative or the beacon of your, because you're, you're your own agent. You're your manager, your publicist. When you're on set, everything comes as really through you. Through you. It's not about how amazing you are with hair if the fashion director can't have a conversation if the beauty director if you're only nice to the celebrity when they come in the room and everyone else you just don't pay attention to when i come in the room of any set and mind you it's, I'm, i don't have an ego ego creates so much distance like you know ego makes me think that you're there i don't want distance i want a connection so when i come into a room everyone knows what it is but i come in i talk to the people who sweeping the floors the guys who make cookies for us during the during catering i want to buy and the better the vibe is, the more the clients will be happy. But it's not just about the celebrity. It's, I want the magazine to know what's happening. I want the people who are behind the scenes at MAC, cosmetics, corporate, or L'Oreal, whatever that looks like, to also see how we color the room with our vibe. So guys, it's vibe is just as it's important to the part of the DNA that you build for yourself as your talent. You know, it's not just about the, the technical skills. I want to, I want we'll we'll be wrapping soon so i want to throw this last question out for everyone to kind of leave with their final statement and if you had to choose you know what your legacy is that you want to be known for or the mark or the imprints that you want to leave in the footsteps that you want to leave in this industry i want you to tell everybody what that is and where it comes from um i always say that i want to build a legacy and i want my I want to be recognized as a creative rather than being a creative associated with my client, right? Like I am not who I am because I work with so-and-so. I am who I am because it's, I am who I am. Yes. I am my sauce, right? So like, 
that's what makes me phenomenal. It's not the fact that you see me with someone or you read something about me with someone else, right? So I want you guys to just, you know, share what that means for you. Like what is, that's what re being resilient is for me. Um, what will your legacy be or what is being resilient to create your legacy mean for all of you? I'll start with you, Sir John. Okay. So for me, in terms of legacy, um, you know, I have, I saw, for example, I'll just keep it quick. I, I'll do master classes and I haven't done like a like year or so, but all around the world, Cape Town, South Africa, I have a cosmetics there, uh, Johannesburg, Iceland. I do master classes in Paris, South America. And for me, it's women are all saying the same thing in unison and they literally all ages and they all have this sense of anxiety and sometimes depression that happens to women in, in a disproportionate way. It doesn't happen to guys because of social media, because of marketing, all this. As soon as you pick up your phone and you look at your phone in the morning, it starts to chip away at your sight, your sense of self. So for me, I think the goal for me is to make women feel at least a bit more whole or give them a sense of, I want them to be closer to themselves. And also in terms of like the legacy, I want to say is that I want you to see a makeup artist and not just not a person of who happens, a makeup artist who happens to be black. And don't, you know, and hopefully I, that can open up the door for other people like, because guys, I used to work and see no people of color for months, you know, just maybe an Asian nail tech. So for me, it's like, as long as we're doing the work, as long as I'm representing, you know, uh, you shouldn't look at my color, you shouldn't look at my sexuality, it should just be the talent. So hopefully if I have a legacy, it's just to like, you know, break down any kind of cultural barriers that they see and box us in. Like so many times the makeup artists have yeah. shown up on and they think I can't do editorial makeup because, oh, you're gonna do too much. You guys don't know what I mean. You're gonna do too much hair or too much makeup. No, I know what simple is. I know what clean makeup it looks like, but it's a preconceived notion because of our, you know, perceived culture because of what we see sometimes on reality shows. And I'll let that go. Felicia. Yeah, okay, first of all, I wanna tell you, Yanni, this is amazing. Your questions are great, a wonderful panel. I applaud you, and I'm just gonna big you up in my DMs later. Um, Let's talk, so, please. <laughs> my legacy, I said that I always, um, I believe you have to have a foundation for anything you build. My foundation is love, love for people, love for women feeling confident and beautiful. And so to Sir John's point, like, traveling around the world and you have the opportunity to talk to so many women who feel broken based on their skin color or their hair texture all these things need healing in our community and i want my legacy to be that i have done the work for the healing that I have loved on every single woman i could find that needed that love and that confidence to heal them from the inside out Yes, the hair is pretty, but what happens is when you see the red carpet hair, you see a woman, brown skin, light skin, whatever her color is, and she's rocking her natural hair, and it's something I've done, it brings the self-esteem up in other women. They write to me and tell me how they never even thought their hair could do that. Or they didn't realize after seeing Issa Rae uh, on season two that short hair could be beautiful or look nice and so for that i have a lot of work to do so the legacy is gonna go on i mean i'm hoping generational generations yes. of legacy of the fact that we and all of us on the on this panel right now we've created things that are are like you said time capsules they're timeless they'll be around forever people are going to look in books and see our work and i'm hoping that they always feel love and confidence and like we mm -hmm. cared about them yes ka take us home first. well not home but your statement <laughs> <laughs> for me the legacy i want to leave behind is one like it's in different particles. Um, there's one component where I want to be able to support all my creatives of every color, specifically black for sure, because I feel like we don't get highlighted as best as we can. And we don't like what you were saying earlier, Sir John, like, you know, we walk in a room and they think, you know, we can't do, you know, we're going to do too much because of the preconceived notion that they have with us. So that's one of the legacies I want to leave behind because <clears throat> I've been able to create opportunities from the things that I've been able to do with my investments and the new business I have to employ other black creatives and not just in here, but outside of here, like the entire team that I have from brand management to management to like the entire thing. So I wanna make sure that like, I'm leaving behind something to tell people to bet on yourself, bet on what it is that, you know, you believe in what you wanna do. Cause at the end of the day, it's all about you before the client. It's all about you before the job. It's all about you on the inside. And last but not least, 
the last thing I want to leave behind is just honoring my mother and honoring, you know, everything that she envisioned for me, everything that she had dreamed for me to do. All right, Keisha. Yeah. And I know your Keisha mom is super, super, super We got super spinach, y'all. But yes, I know. And I know, uh, Paul, we talked, I'm, we are praying for you lifting you up this week. Thank you. Yes. Keisha hey, and- uh, Take us home, baby. Take us home, guys. Take us home. Yeah, two more to take us home. I just want to make sure that, you know, I'm co continuing to open doors for other artists that come after me. You know, as Black artists, we're still in a place in the industry where we have a lot of work to do. And I'm willing to be, you know, one of those artists that do the work for the next generation, you know. Um, so when you walk into a room, you see more uh, artists of color on set, you know, when you go into... Um, when you don't, when you do work, or when you're on the client, you're able to work on um, the, the white girls instead of the black girls. You get what I'm saying? Yep. Um, and I just want to, I just want to be like a status symbol, and I want people to say it meant something to to know him. You get what I'm saying? <laughs> Come on, status symbol. Come on, status love that. symbol. Perfect. That's what it's about. All right, Nikki, you got a minute. Take us home, girl. Okay, okay. The, uh, so my legacy is to, for one, create. Um, a great foundation of a great foundation for my family and siblings, but to also inspire other believers, other dreamers to motivate people. I want those people who grew up or who is homeless right now or don't know how they're going to pay their bills. I want them to believe or look at my story and see that they can be where I am or even beyond where I am. I want to inspire I just want to inspire people to dream and to believe in themselves and get rid of fear. So thank that's you. Like thank you. Right. All right, guys, continue to push culture. Continue to move the needle, guys. Continue to move the needle. Three eight waves, baby. Three eight waves. Right. Thank you so much that's for being about. industry legends. Thank you for spending the afternoon with me. I know you guys are all very busy with your insight and your role in this industry is so powerful. So I thank all of you for taking your afternoon and giving me an hour and sharing your love and your gifts with everyone who was watching near and far. We have people in Africa, we have people in Paris. I've been looking at these comments like oh. just in awe. So I just want you guys Amazing. to know that you guys are inspiring people everywhere. So thank you so much. Um, have a wonderful afternoon. Our next panel will be starting in four minutes, which is the art of creation and how we pivot as industry professionals and generate income and multiple revenue streams. So it's a great conversation. So stay on. We are going to take a quick pause and we will see you. Thank you guys again. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye. See you. Bye.